welcome, welcome. I had to visualize this. What's going on here? At first, I thought it was just light shining down this hallway, bouncing off of things until it got to the end, just like everyone else. Who died and made you unstuck? Then it occurred to me that there was a hood, a corbelled roof, and the, for lack of a better word, backsplashes behind the cups and rings, the stones lining the passages. They were like reflectors. Light was bouncing down the hallway, not from the light in the doorway, but from the reflectors. It was bounced off the rectangular stone behind the cup in the back of the passage to two more light reflectors, the cup basins, adjacent at 90 degree angles, and then back down the hallway. I started to think what we were looking at here was a large-scale machine. From what I can deduce, the astronomical features that have been confirmed are not only accurate, but also indicative of each cairn's individual function within this machine. It seems so unreasonable that this grade of a feat was put forth not just in Ireland, but globally, to keep track of dates and time. But it does seem reasonable to track such movements in such detail and precision if there's an applicable function to reciprocate the expenditure of effort. What was their return? What were they getting off this? They had to have been getting something tangible out of building these structures. Could it have only been spiritual? One cannot live on bread alone. Even churches collect tithes. What tangible physical function would have been serving the populations that invested in these? Whistlers, lightning, spherics, antennas, gold shiny things, pins, and oh yeah, the maybe diagrams of plasma dynamics hidden in their alphabet. I realized the ancients were picking up radio signals from lightning and maybe even other sources of radio signals that were much, much further away. We could make some real money on this thing. We could get in People magazine. People? Hell! National Geographic. Considering all the parts needed for a simple crystal radio, I started looking for the audio amplifier. Then it suddenly occurred to me how well suited the interiors of the passage tunes would be for reverberation of acoustics, just like churches. And then it dawned on me that the whole structure was probably the audio amplifier. It's a triangulated system, one tomb being the amplifier, one being the ground, and one being the receiver. But I might have that a little screwed up. They might all collectively be the amplifier. This also a good time to mention that doth means darkness. It has been closed off and shut down for many years. There's this whole legend about a wife that betrayed her husband king, and the shame was so great that it brought darkness of spirit to the land. Maybe that's what prompted the explorers in the 1800s to use dynamite to excavate it, damaging it beyond repair. Could Doth be the ground? The place where the spark is quelled? Curbstone 51 at Doth is the Stone of Seven Suns, and is the only structure of the three that has passageways pointing to the other two. In order for this to work, there has to be an antenna in the center or offset at another site that's sending and receiving, transmitting the information. Is this what the Lafayette is? The Stone of Destiny? On the Hill of Terra? Is this where the power is transferred? It is where kings and crowns, where their power is transferred. Seems like a pretty powerful place to me. Could the ancients been using other types of antennas? You know what, I think I might have seen them before. What do you think? Uncanny. In my imaginative proposal, this information doesn't just go to this particular site. This information goes to all of the Neolithic passage tomb sites, and maybe beyond. It's as if the ancients wrote codes down at specific places, sort of like radio station signatures. 
Maybe they were using them to transmit radio messages, not just predict the weather. Maybe they were doing more than that. Maybe anyone with an adequately sized pin could stand at one of these magic markers and receive information by tuning into the frequency as noted on the Ohm stone. And maybe, because it comes from an angular direction, it was necessary to carve these frequencies into the corner of the stones as opposed to the flat surface. It brings up the thought that maybe t people took their names from the places, the frequency resonances, rather than marking their territory by carving their names into the rocks, like some bird laid its eggs and eventually chicken started hatching out of them. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure. An adventure? Now, I don't imagine anyone west of Bree would have much interest in adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable thing. Make you late for dinner. <laughs> okay, then. The Ogham stones themselves might have been receivers or transmitters of some kind, and the frequency scratched on them may have been what allowed them to receive the signals. Then it came to me that maybe the 20-minute show wasn't really a 20-minute show after all, but a way of ensuring the entrances were perfectly aligning to the structure with the poles of the Earth, with its magnetic field lines. The 20-minute show would be a confirmation of proper placement, but other than that, nothing to get too excited about. I mean, if anything, after what we're going to discuss, the rising of the solstice sun may have simply been a day in time where the machines were unable to function because of the abundance of direct sunlight. It may have washed out or overwritten the functional faculties of these structures. Is that music? What earth is that coming from? Who's there? I plug the little box in the power cell and the little mouth make it sing. <laughs> That's very clever. Music's a bit old-fashioned for my taste, not to mention very loud and distracting, but hey, okay. I like the beats and shouting. Well, you do. The stations of the year were a big deal to the people who built and utilized these complexes. It's quite obvious that the solstices and equinoxes were foundational in the exact placement and alignment of the mounds and their entrances. These quarter dates mark seasonal milestones. On those specific days, the light of the world changes. There are four more dates that are located in between each of the solar quarters. These dates are also very significant in terms of plant and vegetative cycles associated with light and are also time indicative of weather changes on Earth. In Druidry, gods and archetypes are not the dominant consideration for their spiritual activities or beliefs. Energy is what's important. The ways energies appear and embody certain things have been learned through generations of shared experience as the primary power of the cosmos. There might be a geometric formula for the breakdown of these energies that might help further explain the importance of their exact placements. This is the Druidic Eightfold Wheel of Life and a diagram for the transformation of a right triangle in elementary trigonometry. The Albans are quarter days. So am is November 1st. It helps to glue them together if you notice that what's drawn inside the 180 degree section of the trig diagram resembles the symbol for the astrological zodiac sign of Libra, and it correlates with the circle El Banilud, which is set on September 22nd, cusping the first day of the sign of Libra. Magnetohydrodynamics is called that because the dynamics of magnetism are similar to liquid dynamics, with some differences, of course, but not as many as you might think. Both are subject to a rotational effect known as the Coriolis effect. This effect is caused by a perpendicular inertial force acting on the axis of rotation in the mass of a rotating system. The Coriolis effect is an important factor for the formation of cyclonic storms and other circulating systems here on Earth and elsewhere in the cosmos. Turbulence also causes circular rotation and vortices. Since the rate of spin is greater near the axis, the material near the axis is forced out in either an upward or downward motion, creating a vortex sink. If we take the Druidic Eightfold Wheel of Life, and the transformation of a right triangle, and we convert these two-dimensional diagrams into three-dimensional concept, we might find the Euler angles to be an applicable way to determine the specific vectors and rotational behaviors implied for each, 
and we might even be able to know when and where in the sky to look for certain behaviors to be more prominent. Quite curious indeed. Something's wrong with you. Really. Denial is the most predictable of all human responses. I'm thinking all this is pretty crazy and I might want to stop and really consider my sanity at this point. Put aside logic. Do what feels right. I mean, really? The ancients tuning into some collective information sharing and weather prediction? And what's plasma got to do with it? I mean, what is a vortex besides a handed rule in motion? I've got to be kidding me, right? But then, then I started thinking about the Murchison Wide Field Array in Australia. It's a low-frequency radio telescope with a wide field of view that is capable of high-cadence imaging. By measuring the angular distribution of force-refracted shifts, scientists are able to probe fluctuations at high special completeness, which allows the plasma to be illuminated by the profusion of unresolved celestial radio sources. Basically, the cosmic static, the background noise, backlit the plasma, showing us what had previously remained unseen. Could similar methods have been used in these cases? Are the numerable Neolithic passage tomb sites a wide array telescope of some kind? You know how to use these things? No idea whatsoever. Okay, so we know lightning produces radio waves that can be picked up auditorily via simple AM radio. <clears throat> we know that radio signals can highlight unseen plasma in a field. We know that a wide field of view is needed to collect enough source light to calculate the angular refracted shifts. All right, I'm starting to buy this kebab a little more, but it still needs something. Pepper? There are three ways of radiation to arrive. Direct radiation, sometimes called beam radiation. It's the part of radiation that reaches the ground with a single incident angle without any reflections or absorptions. Then we've got diffuse radiation that represents the part of the radiation that has been scattered in all directions, by particles and molecules in the atmosphere, and so reaches the ground at different angles. When direct and diffuse radiation reach the ground, it is reflected from the ground onto other surfaces. This is radiation reflected, or albedo. If we wanted to see these unseen waves, we might utilize reflection, albedo, to bounce them off multiple surfaces in order to refract them into a more desirable frequency range. Spin is just one way an electron rotates, the other is through its angular momentum, a component of angular momentum of light beam that is dependent on the field's spatial distribution and not the polarization. Those wikis, I tell ya. The internal OAM is an origin independent angular momentum of a light beam that can be associated with a helical or twisted wavefront. The external OAM is the origin-dependent angular momentum that can be obtained as a cross product of the light beam position, center of the beam, and its total linear momentum. In laboratory studies, researchers found that by sending a light beam through a triangular aperture, a pattern of dots appear in the diffraction. By counting the dots, the orbital angular momentum of light can be measured. I'm starting to connect some dots and patterns are definitely emerging. Could the interpretations for the curbstones actually be OAM diagrams? Now, I can hear the brain steamers rolling on about how the diamond-shaped patterns, the lozenges, have been said to be associated with specific calendar dates. How could those OAM diagrams possibly be lozenges if they're supposed to be specific dates? That's a good question. Let's investigate just a little further. This is a schematic of an acoustic sub-wavelength on a flat lens with a focal point. And this is the corbelled vault roof box. And it really gets my ticker going. Just look at those patterns. Next we see a dielectric presence in a low temperature plasma. And now we have the sound conversion ra radiation patterns via gradient acoustic metasurface with space coiling structure. This conversion can change the output of radiation structure depending on the surface, the number of surface layers, the distance between said layers, and the angles and direction of the light. I keep thinking about the camera obscura and the way a pinprick of light can fill a dark room with the image of what's happening outside, albeit upside down. 
The camera obscura effect has been cited by researchers as a possible means by prehistoric man to trace the incoming images onto interior walls as seen in cave art, and is sometimes thought of as a reason behind many ancient reports of apparitions of gods or spirits being witnessed. What if this technology was used as a feature for obtaining precise angular orbital momentum within the diffractive light frequencies? I keep wondering if there wasn't some sort of plate or covering over the window box to better direct and concentrate the light that was to enter the chamber, and what other EMF rays are coming in. Was there a way for the ancients to regulate how much light was coming in and from what direction? All you really need to create this phenomenon is a room of complete darkness and a small hole for the light from the outside to enter, but mirrors can modify its abilities quite a bit. Did you notice anything weird a minute ago? Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. That's a nice trick. If you were going to capture light, it would be great to know exactly when and where the beam of light would travel and enter. It would be even better if you could control it. You know, like with the dial or something. Okay. First, I'll access a secret military spy satellite that's in a geosynchronous orbit over the Midwest. Then, I'll ID the limo by the vanity plate Mr. Big and get his approximate position. Then, I'll reposition the transmitter dish in the remote truck to 17.32 degrees east. Hit West Star 4 over the Atlantic, bounce the signal down into the Azores, up the Comptat 6, beam it back to SATCOM through transmitter number 137, and down to the dish in the back of Mr. Big's limo. It's almost too easy. Is that what these are? Exact diagrams of the light's placement? Are these curbstones the key to gauging energy input? We might also need a reflective surface that will demonstrate the malleable fluidity of said waves on its surface. Water will probably do just fine. A little sparkle to bring out the patterns might help. Good thing there's lots of gold dust left over for making all these shiny, spirally, semi-circled discs and rings and all those pins. We'll just sprinkle some of that on top and voila, presto cymatico, it's magic in a bottle. All right, all right, magic in a coat with rings. Cymatics comes from the Greek word kura, which means wave. Wikis say cymatics is a subset of modal vibrational phenomenon. The apparatus employed can be simple, such as a Chinese spouting bowl, in which copper handles are rubbed and cause the copper bottom to vibrate. Oh yeah, cauldrons are a pretty significant artifact found near and around these sites. Maybe this is what they were doing with all those metal cauldrons, cooking up some radio wave cymatics. This is the Debye ring of diffraction, and an illustration of mosaic layer structures with the four characteristic parameters of vertical coherence length, lateral coherence length, tilt, and twist. Are these principles applicable to the function happening within the chambers? Could the light be being refracted off of these cups and rings and through the cymatics of metallic dust on water over a prescribed textured surface, separating this light and all of its wavelength components both in and out of the visible spectrum, being diffracted down into the desirable frequencies? Is that what these gold balls are about? I really don't think a gold goose laid them. Are these the means of converting collected RF into usable power? Or maybe they are the round, smooth surface used to direct the waves in any desired direction. They're often found in fields. As an old Irish saying goes, may all your st stones turn to gold. They might be good to use for both purposes. Gold is very cool in that it's a noble metal. That means it conducts energy without losing any of it to itself. It doesn't keep any. It, doesn't, it also doesn't break down from the exposure to the elements, such as air, water, etc. Gold is so amazing for innumerable other reasons. I could write a book on just that alone. You know what? I just might. But for now, balls. Gold balls, that is. No, 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 no. This sucker's electrical. But I need a nuclear reaction to, to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. What did I just say? The flux capacitor stores... <laughs> this sucker's electrical. But I need a nuclear reaction to, to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. 1.21 gigawatts! 1.21 gigawatts! Great Scott! What? What the hell is a gigawatt? Doc, my only hope. 
Marty, I'm sorry, but the only power source capable of generating 1.21 gigawatts of electricity is a bolt of lightning. What did you say? A bolt of lightning. Unfortunately, you never know when or where it's ever going to strike. We do now. Many, if not all, of these sites are located above subterranean water systems and ley lines. The ley lines are Earth's magnetic field lines. Almost every type of atmospheric current discussed in this video are aligned with Earth's magnetic field lines. Magnetic fields can change the polarity of light. The subsurface water is something else. Subsurface water is a source of ionization that intensifies the charge density and therefore the electric field, attracting lightning to its location, explains researcher Andy Hall of the Thunderbolts Project. He goes on to say, Standing water won't do that because the ions have no place to collect. The ions spread out evenly over the surface of the water, but subterranean water is trapped in the earth where ions can collect and build concentration, locally intensifying the electric field. Because of this, it is known that lightning strikes naturally cause springs and aquifers. This statement is significant for two reasons. The first is that it highlights the differences in behavior in the water in the ground and the water in the cups. The second is that it gives a specific reason for these mounds to be placed over subterranean waterways and ley lines and supports the assertion that ancients were interested in the electrical activities in the atmosphere. If the distance of a lightning strike can be determined by the clarity of sound and audible volume of the spheric waves, then it is a feasible possibility that the ancients were able to gauge the distance of an electric storm and approximate the area location of a probable lightning strike. Maybe they were even able to attract the lightning to the desired locations. A lightning detector is a device invented in 1894 by Alexander Stepanovich Popov. It was the first radio receiver in the world. We now employ three types of lightning detectors which use radio de direction finding techniques along with analysis of characteristic frequencies emitted by lightning. Thanks again, Wikis to monitor and predict electrical storms. They are ground-based, mobile, and space detectors. I'm not sure at this point if the ancients had any kind of space-based tech, so let's just look at the ground-based and mobile detectors. In ground-based systems, distance is determined through triangulation from multiple locations. Estimation of distance using mobile detectors is determined using signal frequencies and attenuation. The gradual loss of intensity of a flux in a medium is known as attenuation. The wikis say, in electrical engineering and telecommunications, attenuation affects the propagation of waves and signals in electrical circuits, in optical fibers, and in air. Attenuation of electromagnetic spectra waves can also occur by water. When the light rays emitted by the sun hit the surface of clear water, the longest wavelengths are absorbed first. Thus, red, yellow, and orange wavelengths are absorbed at higher water depths. The lower wavelengths have been attenuated by the water, so the short wave radiation of the shorter wavelengths of blue and violets reaches the depths of the water column. That's why the ocean's blue. Tell the kids. Did you know that many of the druidic elemental tables have color associations for each element? In fact, color often plays a key role in many types of magic practice. Even in non-magic religions, incorporation of use of color in their symbology is quite common. Are these concepts of energetic attenuation the direct descendant of ancient color magic? Maybe that's the other way around. You know, family trees can get really confusing with all the juniors and seniors growing on all the branches. This is a continuous movement in the electrical atmosphere between the Earth and the ionosphere. It's a substantial electrical circuit that is continuously flowing through the atmosphere. This current is subject to intensity and character changes that vary from fair weather to thunderstorm conditions and it are often affected by the solar and cosmic radiation. We are learning that the physical mass of the planet is also subject to such currents. So what is generally known to be called the global atmospheric electrical circuit is also now being called simply the global electric circuit. Lightning isn't the only source of atmospheric radio waves delivered to the Earth.
Whistler waves also emanate in radio wave frequencies. You can whistle really loud, you know that? There are just two of the radio players in the rural chorus that dance along the global electric circuit. To introduce you to the rest of the ensemble, I'd like to present to you in his own words, recalled by National Public Radio's Lost and Found series, recorded from Billy River Campground in southern Alberta, Canada, back in 1998. Here is AuroraChorus.com's very own Steve McCreevy. Pause for clapping and mic exchange. Earth is constantly bombarded by particles from the sun. When sunspots or a solar flare send enough of these particles toward the Earth's magnetic field, the skies at both poles light up with the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. The particles also create very low-frequency electromagnetic waves, creating a type of natural radio. It can be picked up around the globe with specially designed receivers. So every year around this time, sound recordist Steve McGreevy heads north where the reception is best and points his receiver at the sky. There's just a whole litany of different natural radio sounds to record. Hisslers and growlers and howlers and tweaks these clusters like a pack of dogs barking. And uh, in the case of this morning, we're having these very soft, hissy whistlers, which are actually fairly rare. It's uh, 5.24 in the morning on Monday. The 22nd of June, 1998, at Watchin Park, uh, Belly River Campground, Southern Alberta, Canada. And we've got these great hissy whistlers happening, and uh, in the right channel, we're hearing the beginnings of chorus. That was a burst of static from something pretty close, a lightning storm. Oftentimes, when I'm recording, you'll hear kind of a and maybe a second or two later, you hear the electromagnetic pulse from the lightning bolt takes a round trip to the opposite hemisphere, and then it bounces back. And in making this long trip, the frequency components are spread out, so you get this downward falling tone, like a sigh or a hiss. These receivers are sensitive enough that a lightning storm could be happening um, a thousand miles away and the static would still be strong. You can just hear all the snapping. Let me turn on this uh, speaker amplifier. You just can imagine there is so much. Oh, in fact, we're hearing some nice noises now coming in. Uh... Okay, this, this is a, a very beautiful sounding event. This is called Chorus. Particles from the sun are hitting Earth's magnetic field and generating these noises, probably several thousand miles out in space. Imagine a soap bubble with wind currents pushing against it, and you can see it deform. Well, that's essentially what happens with Earth's magnetic field. So yeah, I've got these uh, funky looking triangular shaped loops. Five turns of about 350 feet of wire hanging up on the tree, uh, picking up the uh, beautiful sounds of Mother Earth. They're just vibrations of electrical and magnetic energy. And so essentially all these receivers do is pick up the Earth's radio waves and translate them directly to the same sound frequencies. And so the result is just beautiful and amazing. And it's been going on, well, for eons. And they first noticed it in England. In about 1882, the British telegraph operators started hearing these strange whistling tones in their headphones. But it wasn't until the uh, 1930s when some people started associating these with visible northern lights. 
as electronic equipment became more available to the average experimenter and hobbyist, amateurs started listening to this using fairly crude equipment, you know, maybe a phonograph amplifier connected to a barbed wire fence in the middle of nowhere, and similar to what I did when I first heard this myself. When I discovered Earth makes its own radio waves, I was amazed because I'm a nature enthusiast anyway, you know, always been interested in astronomy and science. I've got a long, quite checkered history with radio, beginning as a little kid playing with an AM pocket radio and tuning in distant stations at night, and I've done all sorts of crazy things, planting radio beacons in the middle of the deserts and bouncing signals off aircraft. <laughs> and, uh... Time check. There's a station in Colorado called WWV, which does nothing but transmit the time 24 hours a day on shortwave. Total terrestrial indices for 21 June follow. Solar flux 102 and bold A index 16. Repeat solar flux. But once an hour, WWV gives uh, lets me know what's going on with the Earth's magnetic field, and they give what they call space weather, which is uh, what's going on in the sun and between the sun and the Earth. Solar activity was low. The geomagnetic field was quiet to minor storm. The forecast so, for the next 24 hours. I'm aware that right now the Earth is in a magnetic storm. And it may be affecting power lines right now. It may be affecting satellites right now. Space weather, this, this invisible weather we can't really see or feel on Earth, but indeed it's going on out there. And it's wild. And it's stormy at times, and it's calm at other times. It's just like weather here on Earth. Why, well, at this very moment, I've got my headphones on. These whistlers are really coming in big streams now. There's just one whistler kind of merging into the other, all slowly descending in pitch. Oh, these are so great. Wow. Steve McGreevy in Canada's Waterton Peace Park. That is lovely. If we were going to try to diffuse wavelengths into a desired frequency for use, we might bounce the light over a series of surfaces that would scatter them. The Google Nader states the dielectric is having the property of transmitting electricity without conduction. How did these two concepts help to explain what might be going on here? Here's where the antennas and some fashion come into play. In 2013, a group of researchers built an antenna capable of harvesting dielectric energy and then generating plasma from that harvested energy, the inductively coupled plasma antenna, the ICP. The paper titled, Fabrication of an Inductively Coupled Antenna in Low Temperature Co-Fired Ceramic, explains, an ICP antenna generates a plasma by coupling radio frequency waves generated by a flat spiral circuit through a thin dielectric layer. The RF fields accelerate electrons, which then undergo electron impact ionization with a neutral gas. If sufficient RF power and high enough gas density are maintained, a plasma can be generated. Such antennas are commonly in used in semiconductive processing. These processing-based ICP antennas function at low frequency ranges from 1 to 150 megahertz. 
Hopwood has described the miniaturization of planar ICP antenna devices. The Hopwood research demonstrates that functional spiral antenna devices are possible with diameters less than 20 millimeters. Low fired ceramics. You don't say. Aside from an abundance of carved stones, metal pens, and quartzite, a large number of ceramic beads, pendants, and small spheres have been found at the passage sites. Could these little beads really be little capacitors? Large hordes of jewelry, coins, and other golden goods have also been unearthed in the region. Were these being used for their conductance? The grandest of these finds have been dredged up out of local bogs along with a couple well, very well preserved Bronze Age humans. I guess the bog has that kind of effect on people. That's quite a bit of gold wire. I wonder what we could use that for. And that hat looks really ill-fitting and uncomfortable. Could you imagine wearing one of those large, multi-banded torques around your neck? What about that super thin one? Like wearing white shoes in winter. Wearing it's just asking to cause it damage. Were people into fashionable discomfort then, too? Who are these for? I mean, I guess folks used to wear metal suits to war, so who knows, but still, there has to be a reason they're made so finely, in just such a way. Such exquisite detail and precision, such an extreme to hide it away forever. Why go to all that trouble of fabrication and such a valuable material to throw it into a bog? So much, so much. Could these engraved surfaces be a form of metasurface? Were they being used to convert sounds into visible light, images, charges, plasma, or vice versa? Metamaterials are synthetically structured materials with properties that are not found in nature. Repeating patterns are assembled out of metal or plastics in smaller scales than the wavelengths of EMF they influence. To again quote the wikis. The precise shape, geometry, size, orientation, and arrangement gives them their smart properties capable of manipulating electromagnetic waves by blocking, absorbing, enhancing, or bending to achieve benefits that go beyond what is possible with conventional materials. That sounds like a lot of different words for attenuation. Metamaterials are also very intriguing because of their ability to create artificial magnetism. And they do this really neat trick called negative refractive index, which means that the light is bounced back in the same direction from whence it came. The index is the angular degree to which they do that. This is so cool because it gives one the ability to build with light by layering these projected frequencies in ways that light naturally doesn't bend and layer making holograms possible. In regards to the loss of intensity occurring during this process, metamaterials weren't efficient at transferring the same power in ohms. This was resolved by introducing liquid crystals, such as mica or quartz, on the metasurface. The efficiency was increased to such a precise degree that the technology may now be used for optics. Gold was another metal that would increased the efficiency of the information transfer because of its noble properties. So gold could reflect back a prismatic refraction without losing lumens or energy. How lucky. There's no such thing as magic. This is exactly what the nerds want. Check out those U-shaped apertures. They sure do look a lot like the crescent shapes found on Curbstone 52 at Noth. Like, a lot, a lot. Actually, these two images describe each other rather well. But wait, it gets even weirder when we compare figure 25 from the Metasurface article with Martin Brennan's Nomen figures I collected from a Mark Turler paper I'm going to discuss in a little while. Incredible. This might even be a side view of the proposed action. Could all of these engraved spirals be indicative of the metasurfaces necessary to produce holograms of types of energy waves? 
Let's look at this interesting experiment showing how sound can be focalized using a superlens and a hyperlens. The sounds are channeled using air ducts and corrugated brass and projected over a grid of hollow amplifiers. In this case, it was a grid of empty soda cans. It makes me wonder if similar techniques were achieved utilizing the different types of corrugation that can be seen in various types of gold torques found throughout the region. And again, I'm drawn to curbstones at North. Once these frequencies have been separated, their polarity might have been altered to match the desired polarization, and a desired projection vector might have been able to be established using the OAM of a Gaussian beam as shown with the OM fuse later in the video. Those letters are going to start to spell some pretty interesting words, like torque. Interesting twist that in physics, torque is the rotational equivalent of a linear force, and also the thought that one rivet pivots. I wonder why the spirally ones clasp shut. They're so different from the other ones. They're so perfectly spun too, but they'd make awesome coils. The size and spacing of the spirals troughs and ridges also reminds me of the corrugation used outside of electrical transformers to dispel heat. Scratch his head and raise his eyebrow. Another thing that comes to mind when reading the ICP paper is the term coupling. Nowadays, we're accustomed to receiving energy and information through wireless transference. This is done through the coupling of frequency fields. We all love the internet. I sure know I do. It's where I found this diagram of wire endless cup wireless energy coupling in an RFID chip and this image of a curbstone at Noth. Again, remarkably similar. This is a diagram of the interiors of Newgrange and Noth, including an inventory of found objects and the objects locations. The distribution is telling. That's a lot of metal pins on one side and ceramic spheres on the other. South and west for pins, north and east for balls and pendants. Looking at the overhead map, you'll see that the pins are on the river side of the complex. The ceramic pendants and balls are on the inside of the triangle, away from the river. Does this imply a directional flow of some kind? Are we seeing the placements of anodes and cathodes within the ancient chambers? It's perfect. Nice long run that goes clear across the bridge over the ravine. You know, over near that hill there, the housing development. Right, Doc, but according to this map, there is no bridge. Marty, it's perfect. You're just not thinking fourth dimensionally. Right, right, I have a real problem with that. If we are going to collect dielectric energy of an ambient field and incoming atmospheric electricity via antennas and convert that into usable energy, we might want to utilize some means of piezoelectric oscillators to regulate the resonance of the charge. Good thing the whole frontage of New Range is faced with an interesting quartzite gradation. Toby Hall of the Stonelight Group, a group of researcher researchers including Martin Brennan, whose work was cited in the Turler paper, has also been studying the astronomical associations for the mounds for over 30 years and says the cairns were originally built in a cake-like layering with white quartzite covering the tops of the mounds. The front of the facade of Newgrange was arranged in such a manner that it is now by Michael J. O'Kelly in the early 1960s during an excavation and renovation Either way, the quartzite acts like a filter that only allows in the desired frequency. It's a very important component in an oscillating circuit. Quartzite makes awesome acoustic resonators. Quartzite grains are a metamorphic silica sandstone that has been crushed under the pressure and heating of tectonic activity, and as such, are indistinguishable macroscopically. That means they all kind of look the same to our naked eye. It also means that large concentrations of quartzite can be seen as one large uniform lattice field. The silica component is also interesting. It is for the most part translucent, which is why it's often used for fiber optics. By lining the entrance with the, dark, the light to dark gradation of quartzite silica, light can be captured, concentrated, and magnified. The darker stones would create a darker, shadowed area where the light would be absorbed. When the light lighter area directly around the entrance of the window box would amplify the light by reflecting it back. If the reflective quartzite background was too bright, the desired frequency may also be reflected back. This could have been regulated through the insertion of contrasting round stones peppered throughout the facade. 
The facade cylindrically dips in just before the entrance and doorway. Those curved corners are lined with only dark stones. The window box is only lined in light stones. These are also strong indicators that the light was intentionally and skillfully directed, probably by O'Kelly when the restorations took place in the 1960s. Why did he arrange them that way? Was it just for the tourists? Or did he know something we don't? Okay. I think I'm going to leave this here for now and do another video on the corresponding alphabet, the Oumphios. Interesting name, isn't it? There's so much more. So, so much more. Oh, great. There's a place for all ideas. Not all of them have to be right, but not all of them have to be wrong either. Most humanoids have the potential to be irrational. Perhaps you should attempt to access that part of your psyche. Sometimes we just don't know where they belong. And sometimes if we can't find that space, we have to make one. Look, I know you doubt me. I, I, know, I know you always have. And you're right, I often think of Bag End. I miss my books. And my armchair, my garden. See, that's where I belong. That's home. And that's why I came back. Cause... You don't have one. A home. It was taken from you. But I will help you take it back if I can. Where will you make yours? We're all here to do what we're all here to do. You must unlearn what you have learned. Thank you for your consideration. Since my customary farewell would appear oddly self-serving, I shall simply say, good luck. Thanks for joining me today. I'll see you again real soon.